This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. What's up everyone, Michael here, and today I'm gonna do a philosophical reaction to the show that dared to ask, what if Tupac has been alive in Amsterdam the entire time? Pretty sure that's Tupac. What? I'm talking about season three of Atlanta. Now in the first two seasons, they use things like surrealism, absurdism, a little bit of existentialism to explore possibility contained in seemingly impossible situations, i.e. that an aging weed dealer could become an international rap superstar, that a college dropout living in a storage space could be the manager for that superstar, or that you can barter your way to wealth in any situation. Actually, let me get this sword, man. But in season three, they seem to be exploring the opposite perspective, which is that sometimes situations that seem like they're brimming with pure possibility actually are riddled with impossibility and really finite limits. And in particular, that these impossibilities can stem from things like racism, colonialism, and its deep history. And these things are so ingrained into the fabric of reality and society as to make them unavoidable. I wanna check out just a couple of episodes from this season to see how some philosophy might help us make sense of what's going on and might help us understand the larger implications of what went down this season. So welcome to Philosopher Reacts to Atlanta season three and spoilers ahead for the show Atlanta, which we're watching obviously. But before we dive in, I want to talk about this video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN secure protocols and uncrackable encryption keep your personal information safe as you navigate the web. Now, one of my favorite things about using a secure VPN like Surfshark is that it helps me avoid price gouging. It's actually pretty simple because Surfshark hides my location, websites can't inflate their prices based on that location. And that can add up to significant savings especially when shopping for things like plane tickets, which are very expensive right now. Another of Surfshark's perks is secure file sharing. Because all of your internet traffic is encrypted, your downloads remain safe and secure. So go ahead, download every image that comes up when you search for Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, but in bikini sipping cocktails, and no one will ever know. Not that I've ever done that or made those images. One subscription covers all of your favorite devices from your laptop, Xbox, and Android, all the way to your Amazon Fire Stick and beyond, including options for apps like Chrome and Firefox. So get started today by clicking the link in the description and using the promo code WISECRACK. When you do, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off, plus three extra months for free. Go to surfshark.deals slash wisecrack or hit the link in the description. Protect yourself online and download Surfshark VPN today. And now back to the show. Okay, so it was hard to pick from all the episodes this season. I want to start with episode four. It's called The Big Payback, which shows us what happens when Doug from the Hangover movies starts a new life in Atlanta far from his sociopathic friends. Note that he's perusing the snacks. Uh oh, he's going to grab the cookies. He's going to grab some cookies. He's going to grab some cookies. Oh boy. Your order. Wow, now the ball's rolling. Oh, he's gonna, he's gonna go give it back. Oh, he's happy with himself. He's eating his crime cookies. He's so happy about it. Okay, this is important. Of a black man suing Josh Beckford, an early investor in Tesla, due to the fact that his ancestors were enslaved by relatives of Mr. Beckford's. That human capital and profit can be directly linked to the financials of the company. So I do think there's merit, and he could win the lawsuit. Not could win, did win. Mr. Umbaye did win the lawsuit. A scenario that seemed... The look on his face right there. That subtle head shake. I like what's going on here. And I think that the cookie scene is interesting, right? Because we see this character get away with stealing something without consequences and being happy that he stole it without consequences. We then cut to a scene where he's in the car with his daughter and we hear about a trial taking place where a black person sues an early investor in Tesla because his ancestors were enslaved by his relatives. But this brings up this question, right? Of how much our identities and our own sense of responsibility is tied to our past and our history. So if we think about this in a classic existentialist framework, there's this idea that we're born completely free, right? Unshaped by external, or historical forces, and we and we alone are responsible for our choices, but not for those of our parents, our grandparents, our great-great-grandparents, and so on, right? This is why Sartre very early on says, existence precedes essence, meaning that what we do shapes who we are, and there's not this 
thing of like who we are. It's pre-programmed, it's determining who we are. Sartre also says that man is condemned to be free. But here the show seems to be starting to pose this question of what responsibility do we bear for choices made by past generations? Particularly if we benefit in seemingly unfair ways from those choices. This brings up this question of freedom versus facticity. So when we think about freedom philosophically, for me at least, I think about the ability to self-determine. So if I have freedom, I have the ability to reflect, decide on a course of action and self-determine that action. But there's this other thing called facticity. And facticity describes elements of my existence that I'm sort of born into, a Martin Heidegger use the term thrownness to talk about this, right? So when I'm thrown into existence, I didn't choose who my parents were. I didn't choose where I was born. We don't choose our hair color. When we're born in history, our class status, we're just tossed into existence by two people who had sex. Facticity describes all of those things that we're born into that are outside of our control, right? Right here, they're bringing up this question of like, are we responsible for that facticity, right? Are we purely free or is it the case that people could be held responsible for the actions of their ancestors and how that affected their lives? And obviously here they're connecting that to the idea of reparations, which is the idea that America owes financial reparations to the ancestors of enslaved people, who again, people who were enslaved were thrown into that situation, right? They did not freely will or determine to be that. We kind of have those twin questions right here. Who is responsible for what and what is the limit of responsibility when we look at history? Our main character, of course, ends up getting sued by someone because his ancestors enslaved hers and she wants some money for it and he's not handling it well. So he reaches out to some coworkers for their opinions. Hey man, how you doing? Pretty good. His whole like demeanor has changed now that he's on the other side of things. Uh, I know it's a crazy time and everything, and uh, I'm, I really don't know what to do. Uh, no thanks. I'm just a guy, you know, trying to get by, and I feel like this woman is harassing me. I, I just don't know what to do. Yeah, that whole notion of like, I'm just a guy trying to get by, really seems like it's him trying to disconnect himself. I grew up with from his history and the way he's benefited from it. The only thing you can do is say you were wrong and give her as much money as you can. She probably want to meet with you one on one, cut you down a bit. I just don't know what to do. Honestly, my advice, you gotta fight that shit, man. It's like when you're a kid and one parent says something you don't want to hear so you go to the other parent hoping they'll say that. Basically what he's doing here. Okay, so we're sticking with this question of responsibility, right? This guy seems to be making the argument that he bears no personal responsibility to the woman suing him, and thus he shouldn't owe her any money in the present, which builds on this existential assumption that he's only responsible for his freely willed actions and that his identity isn't tied to anything other than a sort of pure ontological freedom. Now, the philosopher Lewis Gordon coined the term black existentialism. Gordon takes the existentialist concept of bad faith and bad faith describes what happens when we basically try to treat ourselves as objects without freedom rather than subjects who have freedom. Sartre um, uses the famous example of a waiter that's kind of performing the identity of waiter in a cafe. That's in his book, Being in Nothingness. But Gordon takes this concept of bad faith and uses it to better understand racism. Now, Gordon says the Sartrean position raises the question of racism as a form of bad faith, since it is a form of evasion of human reality. So this means that in acting like institutional historical racism doesn't have tangible effects in reality, white people like our guy in the episode are performing that type of bad faith. When he's huddled, you know, with his coworkers, it seems like everyone's performing that same type of bad faith. Like they're evading the reality of their history, of the country, of their situation. And, and I wanna jump to later in the episode where this all gets laid out there a lot more clearly. Marshall is now decamped to a hotel because in his eyes, his life is falling apart a bit and he makes a friend at the hotel bar. Two days ago, I had a good life and now I'm being by some shit that I didn't even do. So that line there when he says he's being fucked by some house. shit that he didn't even do. It's still that idea that he's like disconnected from history in that way and shouldn't bear responsibility. Maybe it's only right. E, we don't deserve this. 
Well, what do they deserve? We were treating slavery as if it were a mystery. Yeah, he's basically saying that uh, something to investigate. They're not treating the history of slavery as a real material historical thing that actually happened. So now you're what? You're separated from your wife. She's taking your kid. God, this is intense. Now she has to be raised without a father. She has to build wealth and success from the ground up, right? Similar to the position we put them in. We're gonna be okay. Your daughter's gonna be okay. The curse is lifted from her. That's interesting. When he says the curse has been lifted from her, it's sort of like by taking responsibility for that history. His daughter would be untethered from that. We're getting at that fundamental question of how we relate our freedom to historical responsibility. And I've talked about Sartre already, but it's important to know that Sartre actually changed his position from his early existentialism to his later position. He started to doubt the type of pure existentialism, which is kind of similar to Marshall's vibe here, in which social and political history aren't tied to our free existence. And I think during the time where Sartre changed his mind, he also got really influenced by Marxism and the work of, of people like Franz Fanon. Now, in an interview, that took place in 1969, Sartre was asked to describe the relationship between his early and late work. And during the interview, Sartre recalls himself writing that, whatever his circumstances and wherever the site, a man is always free to be a traitor or not. And then Sartre tells the interviewer, when I read this, I said to myself, it's incredible that I actually believed that. And I think we kind of see both sides of that at the hotel bar here. Marshall feels like he shouldn't have to bear responsibility for something that he didn't do. His friend Ernest is basically saying, no, we can't abstract ourselves from a real history, we are tied up in this, whether you like it or not. When he says confession isn't absolution, which means you can't just like, my bad, racism away, you know, he's saying that it has real historical and material effects. And Ernest's position is similar to Sartre's later synthesis of existentialism with historical materialism. Now, historical materialism is the idea that history is shaped by material conditions, material activities, economic reality. History isn't just shaped by ideas, but what happens. And in books like Search for a Method and Critique of Dialectical Reason, Sartre gets into this and kind of, I guess, has his existential cake while eating his historical materialism too. Now, when this guy, Ernest, ties together historical facticity and economic reality, he's arguing against the type of racist bad faith that we saw in the work of Lewis Gordon. And he's operating in good faith, in a sense, because he's acknowledging that, you know, things like slavery and colonialism have absolutely shaped the material and economic reality of lots of people, some for better, some for much worse, and that his subject group has benefited from this. Now, there's a, a quote from Franz Fanon that I like here. Fanon says, genuine disalienation will have been achieved only when things in the most materialist sense have resumed their rightful place. And I think what Fanon's saying there is that ending like a racist disalienation isn't just about thinking better ideas or agreeing to be better as people, but about materially transforming conditions. And Ernest in this clip seems to be saying that economic justice reparations is part of what it means to take responsibility. You know, what he does after that is a little much. We're, we're not going to show that. You can watch it for yourself. But I think that episode really opens up a lot of interesting things. You might've noted, however, that the episode doesn't feature any of the characters that we think of when we think of Atlanta. So I wanna check out another episode where we're gonna see all of our friends again. Okay, so now I wanna check out the episode called White Fashion. And I wanna look at both Darius and Paperboy's journeys in this episode. So let's start by watching Darius's arc in the episode where he experiences the struggle of trying to share his culinary culture with a white lady who at first seems genuinely curious and interested. So let's get started there. Are you Nigel? <laughs> yes, I'm Nigel. Oh, couldn't tell. Your hair is so weeble. <laughs> so this seems like a nice moment. River State, Ijo. Where Darius is just sharing mm. his culture with someone else. He's connecting with this restaurant owner. This is great. Oh, I love her. Oh, yeah, she's I sweet. need to get her business card. There is a lot of growth potential. This story gets weird, right? When she says there's a lot of growth potential. It's like that shift from looking at a culture in an appreciative way and now seeing growth potential. I mean, I like fish, but boneless fish. Is your Shazam working? And even that, that she has to like Shazam to know the music. Okay. It seems like we're getting more of that type of bad faith that Gordon talks about in so much as this woman doesn't really seem to be considering the cultural significance of Darius being 
originally from Nigeria, what it means to be at this restaurant, experiencing another culture, especially a culture that was under British colonial power until the 1960s. Sartre said, and he said this about reading Fanon, he said, have the courage to read it primarily because it'll make you feel ashamed. And shame, as Marx said, is a revolutionary feeling. And I think in a sense in this scene, we don't see a lot of shame in this woman. And that lack of shame seems to allow her to just see everything in this restaurant as a product or a possibility. And when Sartre makes this point in his preface to Fanon's book, you know, he seems to be saying that like the effects of Western colonialism of slavery should make people feel ashamed because that shame could lead them to breaking that cycle of, you know, racist bad faith and changing things. I wanna now jump to see what happens. It's not good. We'll just watch it really quickly though. Yeah, so here he goes back to the restaurant. It's closed down. Yo, Darius! Over here. The white lady is there. She has started a Nigerian yeah. food truck. So she relocated? I mean, where's Mimi? I don't know. We actually, we never exchanged info. Ugh. What's in it? It's a peach barbecue reduction and chunks. I call it the Darius because you're from Georgia. She even named a dish after him. So like we said before, um, there's some irony here because the country of Nigeria was colonized by Britain. And now this British woman has basically colonized a Nigerian restaurant. You know, in the same book I just quoted um, where Sartre was talking about Fanon, Fanon himself says, when I look for man in European lifestyles and technology, I see a constant denial of man, an avalanche of murders. I think similar to the bad faith of black existentialism, Fanon is here pointing out that when European lifestyles and technology deny the humanity of, of black people and their culture, it allows them to instrumentalize them and use them as they would any other product or resource. And in this case, this woman doesn't seem to be recognizing the humanity of a Nigerian woman and her restaurant and her culture. She sees a concept that can be used to create profit for herself. And of course, Darius seems to be realizing this all in real time. And this is from Sartre's preface once again. He says, you who are so liberal, so humane, who take the love of culture to the point of affectation, you pretend to forget that you have colonies where massacres are committed in your name. And I think when Sartre here talks about loving a culture to the point of affectation, he's getting at this idea that people love cultural products or aspects of culture while conveniently forgetting, once again, kind of in that bad faith way, that massacres have been committed in the name of those people's countries. In this case, you know, we see that with this woman who's from a culture that colonized Nigeria, now like micro colonizing a Nigerian restaurant. Now, while all this is happening in the same episode, Paperboy is having a similar experience on a larger scale and it involves a French fashion company. Okay, so this is presumably a gift to that guy's grandkid from the fashion designer. Okay, it's a jersey that says Central Park Five. Many of you know that the Central Park Five were a group of young black men in New York who were falsely accused of murdering a woman. They were exonerated, but they spent time in jail. It was very, very bad. And now we're using that trauma and pain to make clothes for presumably very rich people. We want to apologize to the community properly. Okay. Um, with your help. And now the same fashion company wants Paperboy to be one of the faces of their apologies for for doing a racism. You're not worried about, you know, what the streets think? The streets? <laughs> I work, man, f the streets, man, I shot niggas. Man, you trying to tell me that you, uh, you wouldn't take any of these uh, free designer gifts? And here we're seeing this tension, right, where Paperboy is taking advantage of the situation to get yeah, some designer clothes. And Ern is asking I the question, sure on the board for at least five years so I can you know, can we do something more here? Then I start my own program. Help out black entrepreneurs and business owners, like a reinvest in your hood campaign. Ern here is encouraging Paperboy to take advantage of the situation and do something positive and use his subject position as a, you know, internationally famous rapper to get this fashion company to do something to empower urban communities and to even, you know, build his own foundation. There's a Fanon quote that I think applies a little bit here where Fanon says, for Europe, for ourselves, for humanity, comrades, we must make a new start, develop a new way of thinking and endeavor to create a new man. Fanon thought it was possible to create a new world and a new humanism. And by, by a new humanism, he means like a universal conception of humanity. And he thinks we do this by first rethinking the type of sort of Western humanism associated with the Western philosophical tradition and, you know, white European humans. So rather than just making the category 
human or, or humanism, this white European human thing, he wants it to apply to everyone. But of course, Earn's ideas here assume a world in which a multinational fashion company would have a genuine interest in helping use their capital to directly invest in black communities. And we see how this goes a little bit when we get to the press conference where Paperboy has to apologize for racism. So let's let's cut there really quick. <clears throat> Clermont with the Parisian, um, Paperboy, after this, is racism over? Okay, so she just asked Paperboy, <laughs> she said, Paperboy after this, is racism over? Um, f no, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I mean, look, look, look at the porn industry, right? Uh, so I think have what he means is that with our new initiative, we believe racism will be done by 2024. He said racism will be done by 20... 24. After that experience and seeing the press conference, Paperboy wants to sort of listen to Earn's advice. So he comes up with a pitch. I just got this idea about black people making money, you know what I'm saying, and putting them black dollars in black hands, and then we just support black businesses, right? Because if you take them dollars and put them back in your neighborhood, your neighborhood will grow. So I figured we just call it the reinvest in your hood campaign, right? Think about it. Reinvest in your hood. Reinvest in your hood. Reinvest in your hood. Okay, so there, again, we see Paperboy truly wanting to do something positive, create some type of change. Now, here's the ad that the fashion brand comes up with. Reinvest in your hood. Think about it, because if you take them dollars and put them back in your neighborhood, your neighborhood will grow. We oh, boys. In your hood. We got cowboys. We got kids and goats. We're all from some hood. We have. We're all from some hood. Old white ladies. Okay, so this ad seems to do precisely what someone like Fanon was worried about, right? It takes, you know, a sort of white liberal humanism and says that black people count, but so do rich white ladies because they're all from some hood. Sartre grew more cynical in his later work in the Critique of Dialectical Reason. And Sartre argued that while well, human freedom is capable of rising up and trying to change the world, and he calls these moments apocalypses, that these movements of freedom and equality run up against institutions. So those could be states, governments, businesses. And here it seems like Paperboy's attempt to use his freedom in a certain situation to do something positive was met with the power of the institution that is a fashion company and a marketing ecosystem in which inclusion only matters when it's including new consumers who could potentially buy their clothes. You know, Sartre says, demanding yet denying the human condition makes for an explosive contradiction. And it seems like that's what's happening here. They're both demanding and denying the human condition, in this case, for black people and people affected by their very messed up ad campaign. So the last clip I wanna look at, you know, we have the aftermath of Paperboy seeing the commercial that the fashion company made. I know what the, the Red Cross is, it's the worst one. I mean, this is intense here in this scene because you see Paperboy, Alfred, kind of like losing, losing hope. Look, ask yourself this, why? Why would a company make a project that would teach black people to stop buying their products and reinvest in their own? Why, why would they fund their own demise? He says, why would they fund their own demise? Look, I told you, I've been doing the social justice thing a long time. Something about that phrase, and I've been doing this social justice thing. Here, this character is basically telling Paperboy that the type of change he wants is impossible in the current system. Think back to Sartre's notion of institutions, right? In this case, the institution of the fashion industry and capitalism are stopping what Paperboy wants to do. In a sense, we see the limits of the optimism we find in Fanon's work. And this brings up a concept called Afro pessimism, which is a philosophy um, attributed to the work of Frank Wilderson. And unlike Fanon's call for a new humanism that would move past colonization and racism, Wilderson doesn't think that racism is, is fixable. He says at one point, blackness is coterminous with slaveness. And in a New Yorker review, they actually compare his position to Fanon's and say that for Wilderson, Fanon's cup is too full. Other previously colonized peoples are indeed human, but not black people. One of the bleakest aspects of Afro-pessimist thought is its denial that there is any meaningful analogy between blacks and other non-whites. And this is all very intense sounding, but for someone like Wilderson, the issues at play here, the legacies of things like slavery, and colonization and anti-black racism are 
baked too deeply into society and into Western capitalism to just change, and especially not via a marketing campaign. Now, I think then with that in mind, we could read this conversation that Paperboy has as this idea that like a, a system built on capitalism and colonization and slavery is never gonna have space for real black liberation built into it. So the best thing that could happen is that, you know, some rich companies funnel some money into some nonprofits so some people can do some good stuff with that. And in this episode, it seems like we kind of go from a more Fanon inspired optimism, humanism to a more Afro pessimistic position a la the work of Wilderson. Now in this episode, both Paperboy and Darius run up against the limits of freedom and their own existential control. Darius sees how an earnest and, and seemingly kind attempt to share a bit of his culture with a new friend can backfire when that person just views that culture as a product to be repackaged in a food truck. And then Paperboy runs up against the institutions of capitalism and consumerism and realizes that no amount of good intentions can make those systems less corrupt. Okay, so it seems that in this season, by introducing a level of harsh impossibility into the lives of its characters, the show is trying to explore a sense of finitude in the world. The idea that there's some things that we can't change and maybe that we'll never be able to change. Whether it be matters of racial identity, the histories of colonialism and capitalism, or even our individual identities. And in doing this, the show is following a bit of a post-existentialist philosophical agenda, right? With Sartre, we're seeing how a seemingly limitless existential freedom can run up against the limits of institutions. With Fanon, we're exploring the alienation and unconscious violence that colonialism and racism have cooked into society and asking whether or not a new humanism is possible. And with Wilderson and the Afro-Pessimist, the show seems to be asking if these problems can ever be solved. And considering that maybe this type of racism is a permanent feature of Western culture. And of course, it's kind of fitting that this all takes place against the backdrop of Europe, a place that in one sense seems more forward and progressive than America, but is also directly haunted by the colonial violence of its past. Do let us know what you think in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, ring that bell. Thank you so much to our patrons. And if you haven't checked it out in a while, give our Patreon page a glance because we got some great new stuff going on there. And remember to check out our new stream, Wisecrack Live, that happens right here every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Later.